going through the going through the stages of knowledge, progressing in the course. There's really less that I need to say. Um, today I was asked to talk about Mara. So I'm giving a short talk on this. So the question, the question we should ask Is that in this world with so much beauty and so much happiness and joy so much that is pleasant and positive. Take, for example, this place that we are in. We've been here many days now. It's hard to find fault. No? The trees, the sun, a little cold maybe. Some. But with all this goodness, with such a peaceful, pleasant world, why is there suffering? Why do we suffer? Ask yourselves, why is it a challenge for us to be in a place like this? Even just to be here is a bit of a challenge. Why is it a challenge to walk back and forth? Why, does it, why is it a challenge to sit still? Everybody has seen or envisioned the meditator, the monk, the spiritual practitioner on the mountain. It just seems like such a peaceful life. Why, is it, why isn't it peaceful? Because really, there's nothing wrong with the world most of the time. Barring natural disasters, catastrophes, accidents. It seems, and we tend to think that life should be quite peaceful. Why is it so hard sometimes? We could ask more generally, why? Why is there suffering in the world at all? Why do we suffer from anything? Why can't we live our life in peace? Why is the world in such a, such a, why is it such a world that we have to experience suffering? Sometimes great suffering. Anguish, lamentation, sometimes despair, depression, anxiety, crippling panic attacks, crippling illness. Why? Why is the world like this? And it's probably, I think, one of the best answers to say Mara. Mara is one of the best answers as to why in such a nice, wonderful world 
there is still suffering. Because it sort of encompasses all that's bad in the world. Mara is a translation uh, translated as evil or malevolence, something that inflicts suffering. It's a kind of a scapegoat, like in Christianity they talk about Satan. Satan is kind of the scapegoat, evil. Something bad happens, you just blame Satan. If you, I don't know, I don't know if Christians actually do this, but I think it's sort of stereotypical that if if you do something evil, naughty, sinful, Satan may be do it. And you could look at it the same way in Buddhism. Mara is pretty equivalent to Satan. I think the distinction is Buddhism is focused on the solution, right? We're not complacent in the ways that some other religions might be. We're not putting our faith in an external source that will save us in spite of our Mara. Um, in some ways, Mara is our adversity, our adversary. This is in some ways a, a war, a battle, a war, let's say, because it's made up of many smaller battles. It's our war with Mara, you know, the imagery of the Buddha on the seat of enlightenment. It was Mara who he had to fight with all the armies of Mara. So it might seem a little bit uh, simplistic to blame it all on one guy, Satan or Mara. But Buddhism has five Maras. Buddhism doesn't stop at just the guy. In Buddhism, there are five kinds of Mara that just encompass everything that's bad, really. Everything that inflicts suffering. So I'll talk about those today. The first is Kantamara. This is the five aggregates, kanda means aggregate. The five aggregates are evil. It's basically what we're seeing. I mean, a more nuanced way of saying it is that they're unable to cause, to be unable to satisfy, or probably better is a cause for suffering if you cling to them, right? When clung to, these five things are the truth of suffering. These five things are, are suffering, stressful. I mean, in general, they're, 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 um, they're pretty un, unreliable. You can't really depend upon the five aggregates. Not in the ways that we think we can. So Rupa Kanda, it's Mara because it's not dependable. You can't depend on the body to work the way you want. The body is full of all kinds of illness. From the moment we're born, some babies get sick or are born with debilitating illnesses. But we all face the challenge of dealing with rupa, dealing with the physical. Coronavirus, a very good example of this, no? You hear about some people whose lungs have been destroyed by it. I don't know, some people might think it's all just a big conspiracy and that's not actually true. I don't know, I don't know anybody. But you can't tell me that illness doesn't exist, cancer. If you've ever seen someone who has just been crippled by cancer. I met one of my students um, from, from 10, 12 years ago in uh, California. I met her again, I didn't even recognize her. She was 
withered and in a wheelchair, could barely move. It wasn't cancer, it was some muscular dystrophy. I'm not actually sure what the sickness was. And uh, she came to see me and I didn't recognize her, but I gave her a blessing. It was so long ago, I had many students, I didn't remember her. But she remembered me. She couldn't talk, she held her hands up in respect. And, I saw her two times, and then she passed away while I was there. I was only there for 15 days. I just happened to be there when she was on her deathbed, and she was able to come to meet me before she passed away, which was nice. This is Kandamara, one of our teachers, Edit. She has a condition. We talk about this a lot. We all face sickness, old age, our eyes don't work, our ears don't work. We get ulcers and heart disease, diarrhea, constipation, kandama. The upshot of it is simply, as I've said, you can either try to fix all of this and avoid all this, all the unpleasantness, which is sort of what we're taught to try to do. Or you can learn a way to face it, and to rise above it, and to be independent of the khandas. It's a problem if you decide that, I like rupa, I like body, I'm just going to do what I can to make it good. That's a problem. The problem is that you like that. You become dependent on that. And when it changes, the meaning of rupa, they use the word rupa because rupati means to change, to, to, uh, to alter, to be subject to alteration. The rupa changes. And you'll be very, very upset when it changes. We in Akanda, we are very much attached to happiness, pleasure, even calm states. But Vedana is the worst, no? Vedana is where all our pain is painful feelings. If you want pleasurable feelings or calm feelings, you'll be very upset when painful feelings come. When restlessness comes, when you're, when you're not calm. If you're calm, you can't handle not being calm. If, you're, if you like happy, happiness or pleasure, you can't stand when you have displeasure or pain. And it becomes worse and worse and you become addicted to pleasure. Kind of like a drug addict. So we have two choices. We can continue to cling to the pleasant side and try to eke out as much as we can, hoping that we aren't one of those people who has to meet with great crippling pain in our lives. I don't know if any such people really exist. Or we can find a better way and become independent, independent of feelings, so that we still feel happy, we still feel pain. But our peace and our happiness doesn't depend on the pleasure and the pain and the calm that we feel. Sanya, the third one, is recognition or memory. This is sort of a an indirect problem though. We have problems both with not being able to remember and problems with having to remember, right? It is a great source of stress and torture to have traumatic memories of the past come up again and again. Recognition, if some, something can trigger a memory, a sound, a sight, or even just simple ones, you see a spider, freaks you out, someone who is afraid of spiders. 
I remember in Sri Lanka telling this big guy, you know, taking him to his room and said, okay, this is your room, there's your bed, and there was a spider about this big on the floor. I said, oh, there's a spider on the floor, you might want to get that out. And then I showed him and then I said, okay, I'll see you later. Went to my room, but a little while later he came knocking on my door, can you get this spider out of my room? <laughs> Freaking out over a little spider. Sanya is this the recognition, the the, uh, the perception of something as something. Because if you see a spider, it's actually just seeing. But once you recognize it's a spider, it triggers a, a fear. Uh, the, the much more horrible ones are, are past memories or, or the future, being reminded again and again of things that you have to do in the future. The anxiety of having to give a Dhamma talk, for example. Yeah. I've had to give Dhamma talks in front of hundreds of people in, when I was a young monk. It could be quite a thing to have to remember. Oh, I have to give a talk in front of the whole city tonight or something like that. They wanted to hear the foreign monk speak Thai. Sanya, Sanya. It's one of the one of the really important lessons that can be so valuable because it's pretty quick to to to, to see fruit is uh, the ability to separate the Sanya from the, the trigger reaction. When you are able to remember something and have it just be a thought, or when you are able to see or hear something and have it only just be seeing or hearing smelling, or tasting, feeling. When past memories don't torture you anymore because they're just memories. Sankara, Sankara is so many different things, the fourth one. Sankara is where the true evil is. Um, but here I think simply just referring to well, sankara, let's say, is habits. Sankara can be judgments, it can be things like racism, uh, bigotry, xenophobia. I say these because sometimes they can be ingrained where you don't want to be that, but you are subtly bigoted. It's things like what they call male privilege, right? Not realizing uh, how you oppress women just by habit no. in societies where men are, are considered superior those kinds of things uh, white privilege and so on not realizing that things are, are um, not realizing that you have ingrained prejudices that oppress others and so on I mean it's just sometimes our uh, perceptions of things can be skewed and are skewed over a lifetime of, of culturalization. Sankara can be evil because Sankara means formation, right? And so you, you, you develop these formations and as many of you are seeing, they're, they're ingrained. You can't just turn them off. You can't stop getting angry. You can't stop liking or wanting things. The answer is not to fix these things, it's to see through them and to gain the understanding that prevents them from arising in the first place. Their habits, it takes work. So Sankara is evil, you say, oh, this is where you see how evil you are. Sometimes it's a meditative you think, I'm so evil. And it's just how you see all the mara inside of you. And don't, don't let it discourage you. This is actually a good thing to see it. You know, the first step of becoming a good person is realizing that you have things that make you a not good person. But I said, to that extent, the person is wise. But a person who thinks they're good when, or thinks they're better than they are, that's where the real scary scariness comes from, thinks that their evil is good. Yeah. 
And vinyana, vinyana khanda. This is the hard one, I think. It's hard for us to think of vinyana as being evil. This is scary. This is what keeps people from wanting to experience nibbana. Um, so, I think it's hard to talk about how vinyana might be evil. And I would just say that the, prob the, the, the main sort of theoretical, the true problem with vinyana is that you're forced to experience all these things. You can't control and say, "Etam me vinyana mutur, etam me, evang me vinyana ma ahusi." Let my vinyana be thus, let my vinyana not be thus. So, in other words, I only want to experience good things. I don't want to experience bad things. Vinyana means consciousness, so the awareness, the fact that we're even aware, is a problem because we have to be aware of things we like and things we don't like equally. You can't control it. But ultimately there is something, a deeper truth there, that even the cessation of vinyana is a, a very peaceful experience. Someone who's experienced that, it's really hard to talk about because the vinyana has ceased, right? There's not even an awareness at that moment. But there is true peace and I don't, I, I don't want to try to convince you of that, but I wait for if you experience it, then you can say for yourself whether it was a good thing to experience. But these are the the, the truth of, of the evils involved with the khandas, the aggregates, that there is evil involved with them. And really, ultimately, it's their only evil if you cling to them. If you don't mind the fact that you experience pain and so on, then Right? If you've come to the point where you're independent of it, you're not uh, reactionary towards it, then they have no power over you. Anisito Javiharati, dwelling independent. So that's the first one. Four more to go. The second one is uh, Kilesamara. Well, this one's easy. But it's something that I haven't maybe outlined to everyone, so just to remind you. There are only three kilesa or defilements that we're concerned with. And if you really want to know whether you're, you're progressing, it's not actually precisely about how calm you feel or how quiet your mind is. It's about the change in greed, anger, and delusion. If you're seeing over time, and it can be hard during the course, but over the years that you practice, the progress that you see is that you have less greed, less anger, and less delusion. That's really the only correct answer. If you have less greed, less anger, less delusion, um, then you're progressing on the path. So greed includes any kind of liking or wanting, anything that makes you more dependent on something. This is considered a defilement because of how it pulls you and keeps you dependent and creates triggers for stress and suffering when you don't get what you want. Uh, anger, of course, is in, in boredom, sadness, fear, depression, frustration, disliking, aversion. All of these are directly painful. It's not pleasant to experience them. It's not a cause for happiness for yourself or others. It causes you to lash out and hurt others. It creates all sorts of problems in life. And delusion, delusion is the worst. They say about greed that greed isn't highly, isn't highly um, blamed in the world. People don't blame you so much for being greedy. Not, not generally speaking. It's, it's, it's not easy to see the fault of it. Why? Because it's pleasant. Greed can be very pleasant, so it seems like, yeah, you like this, good, I like this too. <laughs> Liking things is what we do. But it's slow to change. It's a hard one to change. Craving and greed is, is slow to change. You can't easily free yourself from your desire for things, so that you get stuck very easily and have a hard time freeing yourself from it. 
and so it, it spreads and, and it's very sticky. Uh, anger is highly blamed. It's a cause for a lot of strife. When you get angry at someone, they tend to get angry back and you cause trouble. No one likes someone who's angry, or if they do, it just makes them angry as well. And we can go and fight together or against each other. But it's quick to change. Anger being painful, it's not, it's not hard to become aware of how bad it is. And so it, it's quicker to change than grief. So these two have their, their uh, one is, they're better and worse. Greed is worse because it's slow to change. Anger is worse because it's highly inflamed and causes lots of problems. They both cause lots of problems, but delusion is highly blamed and slow to change. So it's the worst. Furthermore, delusion is what gives rise to greed and anger. You can't have greed or anger without delusion. Uh, delusion includes ignorance, misunderstanding, conceit, wrong views, even just adherence to views when you hold on to something as a view instead of being open to experience reality. It can be hard to experience reality even if you have right view, if you're clinging to the view. And I already know this. So. If you already know everything, it's hard to learn anything. It's hard to have an open mind. Delusion, conceit, arrogance, stubbornness, and so on. Even worry, anxiety is a kind of delusion. Anything that is a distortion of, the, of, of reality, a twist, a twisting of the nature of things. Uh, something that obscures reality in some way through ignorance or through darkness the darkness of delusion. So these are Mara. This is, a, this is the most precise enemy that we're faced with. Because honestly, the, the aggregates are not our enemy. Right? Again, it's only because we cling to them and the clinging has to do with greed, anger, and delusion. So our real enemy is really just these three. They're the ones that we're vigilant and trying to, to see, focus our attention on. That helps. It helps to know that, I think. It will help you to focus your attentions and your efforts. And to be encouraged as you see these decrease, to know what's wrong and to be aware that everything else is not really something to be concerned with. And the third Mara is called Abhisankara Mara. Abhisankara Mara is um, Bhisankara refers to karma, actions. Um, both the mental formation and the actual actions that we perform, it's the, sort of the outcome of our defilements. Because of greed, anger, and delusion, we, we hurt ourselves, we hurt other people, we do things that cause turmoil. The turmoil in the world is all because of people's abhisankara, which in turn is because of their defilements. But so much of the evil in the world is the actions, you know. If you're frustrated and you punch a wall, well, you haven't solved your problem, you've created more problems. But when you punch someone else, you've created a real problem. When you yell at someone, when you manipulate others, steal from them, lying, cheating, even taking drugs and alcohol, the confusion that comes in the mind, you really created a problem for yourself. If they're addictive drugs or if they're delusionary, you know, drugs that mess up your mind. You create problems for yourself, for others. People who drive drunk, for example. That's a real abhisankara. There's a lot of this in the world. This is another mara. Uh, the fourth is Machumara. Death, the Buddha singled out as a Mara. Machu means death. Death is a Mara in a way that anything else isn't because it 
puts a limit on everything. Any argument you might make for another way of solving your problems, well, I will just cure illness, no? solve world peace. The world eventually could live in peace and harmony, but you'll still die. Death is a certainty. And regardless of certainty or not, it's certainly evil. It's evil in that it puts a, puts a stop to all of our efforts. Any one of us might die tomorrow. That would be the end. Who knows where we'd go. We'd be, if we're lucky, maybe we'd continue. Now, having practiced mindfulness, there's something very fundamental about the practice of, of mindfulness as a purity of mind and the clarity in the moments. That even if you forget all of us, even if you do lose track of Buddhism and meditation, there's still some quality of mind that makes it very easy for you to pick it up in future lives. That's why some people in this life are able to practice quite easily and others are not able to practice very easily at all. So it's a great encouragement that by doing something so fundamental to the quality of mind, we are bettering ourselves not only in this life, but in the next. For someone who hasn't practiced mindfulness, it's such a scary thing. It's hard to know where you're going to go when you pass away. Death is a very traumatic experience for many people. It's a sobering, sobering reality, and it's something the Buddha recommended we reflect upon often. Because it reminds us that all these things we might be doing in the world, they all mean nothing in the face of death. Everyone in this room will be dead, probably, most likely within a hundred years. And so all of, the, all of our ambitions in the world, it's a very useful lesson to think of. It helps us to a reminder that we can't take anything with us when we die. All we carry with us are our qualities of mind. Go to the fourth Mara. The fifth Mara is Deva Puta Mara. And this is the guy. Or the people. It's apparently a classification of angels that of Devas that uh, delight in the creations of others. There are devas who apparently encourage humans or want to encourage humans and other beings to make a mess of things, to create. They probably delight in war. They delight in capitalism. They probably delight in technology, delight in wildfires, I don't know, They're beings that delight in creation. So some of them might not even be all that evil, but they are, they're a unique adversary in Buddhism in a way that they wouldn't be for maybe other religions or certainly not for secular people. They, they encourage ambition. They encourage the lay life, marriage, kids, uh, ambition of all sorts, creation of all sorts. And so the Buddha posed a, a unique problem and a unique uh, source of anxiety for these angels because he taught people to let go, to give up, to be content. Contentment is a is, uh, is antithetical to the, these sorts of angels, devas, and people as well. Many people are horrified to think that Buddhists give up worldly pleasures, right? My parents were horrified that I stopped playing guitar, right? of all things. It was a, such a sad day to hear that I was no longer going to play guitar. 
This is, uh, and people are, get up, even upset to know that you're no longer going to create, you're no longer going to cultivate pleasure. And so the Buddha called these, these beings Mara. He said, I know you, Mara. You are Mara. When in fact it seems that they were just like everybody else, wanting pleasure, delighting in creation. It points out the unique quality of Buddhism as um, not just about being a good person. Because these angels were okay, the devas, they weren't trying to make you suffer, they were just keen that you should make things. And so they said to the Buddha, stay as a lay person, or the Bodhisattva, stay as a lay person. You can do wholesome things as a lay person, you can do lots of good as a lay person. And the Bodhisattva said, I know you, Mara. Hmm. And uh, many, many monks as well. And Mara came to a bhikkhuni once and said, what would a woman know about wisdom? <laughs> Trying to bait her, I guess. Or maybe he was just misogynistic, I don't know. But he said, what would a woman know of wisdom? She said, what, what of woman is there in wisdom? What does, a woman, what does the word woman have to do with wisdom? There is no gender in the truth. And Mara would try to, very much trying, these angels very much trying to stop people like us. So, you can sometimes uh, get a sense that Mara might be playing games with us. I wouldn't put too much weight on this, it can make you very paranoid. But it is sometimes useful to think of the strange things that happen to you in your life as Mara. And the best way to do that is to just remember there are five. That if during our meditation course something terrible happens in the center, it could be any of the five. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are angels out to get us. Luckily, we have many devas who appreciate what we do. There are many Buddhists up in heaven, and here on earth, many devas who look after Buddhists because they themselves have listened to the Buddhist teaching. So we do have some protection there. But we don't have to look to the deva world to know that the world is full of Mara. And Mara can take the shape of people, devas, or just the circumstances of our universe, sometimes the results of our past karma showing up in, uh, in the form of illness or catastrophe or, or difficulty. It's an important lesson to not try, not be afraid of things like illness, like COVID, for example, or afraid of accidents, afraid of tragedy. It's important to understand and be familiar with the reality of these things so we're not caught off guard, that we're not even caught off guard by death. Practicing meditation is, one, of, one thing it is, is the preparation for death. Not that we spend all our time thinking about it, but that we become someone who can say we are prepared for death in a way that most people are not. That death is not something that scares us because we have come, uh, we've become independent of our experiences. We have understood the, the, the nature of reality and we understand that death can be no different than what we experience here, just more seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. The ordinary person is dependent on experiences being a certain way because they haven't come to terms with what might be. And that's what you're going through in meditation. You're experiencing things that you normally are not comfortable with, are not able to face. And meditation is about expanding the realm of what you can face. You see, so you're in a laboratory here. There's no, there's no danger. 
You have all the time that you need to uh, investigate and to look into these things that you are normally so afraid to face and to gain this ability to face them to the point that nothing scares you, that reactions are not a part of your experience, and you dwell independent and at peace, happy without an object, without needing something to trigger the happiness. So, and then you can enjoy the beautiful world because there's really nothing wrong with it, as long as you don't cling to it. So that's my teaching on Mara. That's the talk for today. Have a good day, everyone. Uh,